It's a real pleasure to be here. I want to thank the Shadow of a Market Committee, Mickey, um, for inviting me, and also the Manhattan Institute for, for hosting this. This is a, 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 a real pleasure for me to be here. I've known many of the Shadow Committee's members for quite a long time, probably longer than I care to admit. Um, and over the years, I have learned a lot from the position papers and the conferences they've put together. Um, it's a very serious group of economists. And uh, I do share with them the view that the act of exchange of diverse ideas and careful deliberations ultimately result in better policy decisions. And today, I'd like to share some of my perspective as someone who has participated in some of those policy decisions, as Mickey said. I'm going to comment on how I approach monetary policy making in an uncertain world, um, review the types of uncertainty policymakers and economists need to deal with, and then provide some recommendations for improving monetary policy communications. And of course, the views I'm going to present today are my own and not necessarily those of the Federal Reserve System or my colleagues on the Federal Open Market Committee. Now, I believe monetary policy should be set based on the outlook for the economy over the medium run, because this is the time horizon over which monetary policy can affect the economy. I like to focus on the underlying fundamentals in determining that median run outlook, and I've cautioned against overreacting to short-term fluctuations in the economic and financial data. I believe credible policy communications play a key role in policy making. It's been well established that when the public has a clear understanding about how monetary policy is likely to change as economic conditions evolve, whether those changes and conditions are anticipated or not, monetary policy is more effective. Policymakers can improve the public's understanding by being clear about the goals of monetary policy. Those aspects of the economy monetary policy can and cannot influence and the economic information that influences their forecasts and policy decisions, as well as by striving to be systematic in their policy responses to changes in economic conditions that influence the outlook. When the public has a clear understanding of the strategy monetary policymakers follow in normal times, not only will they be able to make better financial and employment decisions, they'll also understand when non-standard monetary policy action is required in extraordinary circumstances. Now, the Federal Reserve has taken many steps over time to improve its policy communications. Recent enhancements include the chair's press briefings four times a year, the summary of economic projections, and the statement on longer-run goals and monetary policy strategy, which established an explicit numerical goal for inflation. So CNBC's August Fed survey of market economists, fund managers, and strategists revealed to my mind some pretty troubling news. Nearly half of the respondents reported that they believe current Federal Reserve policy is mostly influenced by the current data, while less than 40% said they think it's influenced by the median run outlook, and the rest were unsure. 60% said they thought the Fed doesn't have a framework for deciding when to adjust policy, while only about a quarter of the respondents said they think we do. These results suggest to me that our policy communications could benefit from further enhancements. Recently, the FOMC has been describing its policymaking approach as being data dependent. Unfortunately, I believe there's some confusion about what the Fed actually means by data dependent. This phrase has provided a transition from a period of explicit forward guidance, which was used as a policy tool during the recession and early in the recovery, back to more normal policymaking times. But this transition has posed somewhat of a challenge for FOMC communications. After the great inflation of the 1970s, the FOMC became more predictable and systematic in how it reacted to changes in economic activity and inflation. So the public actually had a pretty good sense of the Fed's so-called reaction function, and explicit forward guidance was rarely used. But the Great Recession required the Fed to behave in a way quite distinct from past behavior, and consequently, there's less understanding today about how policymakers are likely to react to incoming economic information. Another factor complicating communication is that market participants prefer more explicit statements and less uncertainty. Thus, they may interpret the forecasts of the economy and the appropriate policy path as having more certitude than they usually actually do, 
which creates some communications issues when the forecast and policy path change. The concept of data dependence was meant to reinforce the idea that the economy is dynamic and will be hit by economic disturbances that can't be known in advance. Some shocks will result in an accumulation of economic information that changes the median run outlook for the economy and the risk around the outlook in a way to which monetary policy will want to respond. But some of these shocks will not materially change the outlook or policymakers' view of appropriate policy. Unfortunately, referring to policy as data dependent could be giving the wrong impression that policy is driven by short run movements in a couple of different data reports. It may even suggest that policy setting is unsystematic and that the salient data reports may be viewed as changing from meeting to meeting. We seem to find ourselves in a situation where market participants and commentators view any one monthly or quarterly data release as the definitive piece of evidence that will result in either a policy action or no action. I mentioned that market participants tend to like certainty, but that applies more broadly. In many situations, people prefer certainty. But the world is an uncertain place, and I think policymakers should find a better way to acknowledge and convey that uncertainty. The 16th century French philosopher Voltaire said, uncertainty is an uncomfortable position but certainty is an absurd one. In other words, we might prefer to live in a world with more certainty, but we don't. And to pretend we do live in such a world is absurd. It can lead to bad outcomes. In terms of economics and monetary policymaking, uncertainty comes into play in a number of ways. For example, price stability and monetary policy are intimately linked, but setting monetary policy to achieve price stability isn't trivial. There's uncertainty around our measures and forecasts of inflation and about the transmission of monetary policy to inflation. Recently, economists have been focusing on the uncertainty surrounding the underlying structural aspects of the economy, such as the longer run levels of the unemployment rate, trend output growth, structural productivity growth, and equilibrium interest rates, and their implications for monetary policy. As former Federal Reserve Chair Alan Greenspan pointed out, Uncertainty is not just a pervasive feature of the monetary policy landscape. It is the defining characteristic of that landscape. Now, one type of uncertainty economists and policymakers need to confront is data uncertainty. The US statistical agencies provide excellent service using best practice techniques to gather large volumes of high quality data on numerous aspects of the economy. But even the highest quality data are inevitably measured with some error and are sometimes subject to revision as more information is gathered. For example, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the 90% confidence interval due to sampling error for the monthly change in non-farm payroll employment is about plus or minus 115,000 jobs. Of course, users of the data know this, but we do tend to ignore this issue. Now, Charles Mansky has written extensively on what he calls the problem of incredible certitude. Downplaying the fact that the official statistics are measured with error can lead less sophisticated users of the data to believe that they're more precisely measured than they actually are. Mansi points out that the idea that economists, policymakers, and the statistical agency should do much more to convey the sense of error around the statistics is not a new idea. It was strongly encouraged more than 50 years ago by Oscar Morgenstern, a founder of the field of game theory. Now, things have improved since then. Revisions in some of the data reports, like GDP growth and employment, routinely get media coverage. And a body of research investigating the implications of data revisions for forecasting, structural modeling, and policy is growing. Still, it seems likely that the imprecision in some of the data and the difficulties in forecasting are not fully appreciated. This comes to light every month in the days leading up to the release of the monthly employment report. Today, for example, economists are polled to see what they expect the monthly number to be. And then when the report is released, the financial press often reports that the number as good if it exceeds the consensus estimate or bad if it is weaker than the consensus. Little attention is paid to the dispersion in the economist's estimates in the first place, to the fact that the number in the release is measured with some error, 
or to the fact that even a job growth number that comes in less than analysts expected could be strong enough to put further downward pressure on the unemployment rate. Data revisions complicate, complicate making monetary policy in real time. PCE inflation, the measure the Fed uses for its inflation goal, is subject to revision. For example, FOMC transcripts and minutes show that in early 2002, policymakers were concerned about a drop in inflation. Ultimately, much of this drop was revised away. Someone reading the transcripts today, not knowing that the data were subsequently revised, could be quite confused by the discussion. Measurement issues also affect some of the important construct in macroeconomic models. In a number of papers, Athanasios Orfanides, one of the speakers today, has laid out a convincing case that mismeasurement of slack and other unobservables, like the natural rate of interest, led to monetary policy mistakes that contributed to the great inflation of the 1970s. He argues that these mismeasured concepts continue to unduly influence monetary policy today and can lead to poorer policy decisions that induce undesirable fluctuations in the economy. Economists and policymakers also need to confront model uncertainty. Even if we were all to agree on one model of the economy, a heroic assumption to be sure, the parameters governing how economic agents interact with one another would be estimated from the data and would not be precisely known. So there would be uncertainty around forecasts derived from the model and the appropriate policy stance based on the model, even if we knew with certainty what shocks were going to hit the economy in the future. Of course, the situation is even more complicated because economists don't agree on a single model or a single set of assumptions within a general class of models. Often there are competing models or different sets of assumptions that are consistent with the observable data. Before the financial crisis, we may have convinced ourselves that we could rely on representative agent models linearized around a steady state with one interest rate. But the nature of the financial crisis pointed out the inadequacies of these models for understanding the interplay between the real economy and financial markets. The good news is that macroeconomic models are being developed that include more than just a rudimentary financial sector and policymakers at the Fed and elsewhere are broadening the set of models we routinely consult. Nonetheless, while our usual models can give us a pretty good sense of the employment and inflation costs of a change in monetary policy, we're still less able to quantify the financial stability costs and benefits of particular monetary policy paths. So we need to remain humble and continue to examine the economy's performance to assess these costs and benefits. Economists and forecasters have developed several techniques to handle uncertainty. Bayesian estimation techniques are commonly used in macroeconomic modeling to handle parameter uncertainty. Given the model and the available data, these Bayesian methods yield probability distribution of forecasts that reflect both uncertainty about the future evolution of the economy and uncertainty about the parameters of the model. Model uncertainty is more difficult to address. But if we know the set of relevant models and can write them down, then Bayesian techniques can also be used to address model uncertainty. In particular, these Bayesian techniques can be used to average across multiple models based on the model's relative abilities to fit the data. In this model averaging approach, appropriate policy would be the policy that performs well on average across the set of models, but is not necessarily the best policy in any one particular model. A related literature study setting policy using simple rules that are robust across a variety of model and economic <laughs> circumstances. In some cases, it may not be easy to write down all the models that could characterize the economy or associate probabilities to various outcomes. Nobel laureates Tom Sargent and Lars Hansen have developed a robust control approach that can address model uncertainty and misspecification even in these circumstances. Their approach confronts head-on the fact that models are only an approximation to reality, and they show the benefit of choosing the policy that produces the best outcome in the worst-case scenario across models. The policymaker doesn't necessarily expect the worst, 
but she should plan against it because doing so will lead to acceptable performance across a wide array of circumstances. Now, from a practical policymaking standpoint, I find that looking at forecasts from several models gives me a better sense not only of the most likely forecast, but also the risk around the forecast. I don't believe we are at the state of knowledge where a single policy rule can be used to set policy because no rule works well enough across a variety of economic models or in a variety of economic circumstances. But I do find it useful to look at the outcomes of an array of simple, robust monetary policy rules as a benchmark against which to assess current policy. The Cleveland Fed website now publishes the outcomes of seven mon simple monetary policy rules based on three publicly available forecasts. Despite the diversity across the outcomes, I find that the rules provide some discipline in systematically relating incoming data to policy decisions. If the current policy stance is quite different from what the rules suggest, one must carefully consider the factors that support that deviation. One caveat of looking at the outcomes of several models and several rules is that you want to be consistent about it. You must guard against changing which model or rule you favor merely because it happens to produce results that confirm your intuition or preferred policy stance at the time. In terms of policy responses to uncertainty, some results in the literature suggest that when policymakers confront more uncertainty, either in their data or models, they should be more cautious in acting, that is, be more inertial in their responses. However, subsequent research has shown that this is not generally true. For example, Sargent points out that caution does not necessarily mean doing less. When there's uncertainty, it might be better in some cases for policymakers to act more aggressively, not less, because aggressive and preemptive action can prevent the worst case outcomes from actually coming about. Another factor that can affect whether the policymaker should be inertial or not is the public's understanding of the publishing, public policymaker's reaction function and the policymaker's commitment to following that reaction function. For example, if the policymaker hasn't effectively communicated, retaining a very accommodative monetary policy stance might be interpreted as signaling a gloomy economic outlook rather than as a preemptive mood against downside risk. This points out the importance of clear communications, the starting point for my talk today, and where I'd like to conclude. It might seem counterintuitive, but I think we could, would clarify things for the public by acknowledging uncertainty and focusing attention on the median run outlook rather than on short run fluctuations in the data. So let me offer three recommendations that I believe would improve FOMC communications. First, the FOMC should publish confidence bands around the projections in the summary of economic projections. Four times a year, the FOMC summarizes committee participants' projections of output growth, the unemployment rate, inflation, and the associated appropriate policy path. For the past year, we've also been providing the median projections across the participants for each variable. Although it's a topic of discussion, the FOMC does not publish error bands around these projections. I believe we can improve our communications if we did. Confidence bands are a standard part of forecasting, illustrating that the future is inherently uncertain. The confidence bands would give the public a better sense of the normal type of forecast variation one should expect to see, so they could better understand some of the risks around the forecast and subsequent changes in the forecast. The confidence bands would also be a helpful reminder to policymakers to remain humble about our ability to know the future with much certainty. Although the public at large may not be aware of it, the committee does publish a summary table of the average historical errors of projections from 1996 through 2015 made by various private and government forecasters. We can apply historical errors to the median FOMC projections to get an approximate symmetric 70% confidence interval for each variable. That's illustrated in figures one to four, which should be at your tables. So if we look at figure three, the error band around the inflation forecast one or two years out is about plus or minus one percentage point. Keeping these confidence bands in mind helps one to judge progress towards our policy goals. 
In addition, the figure clearly shows that even though the dispersion across FOMC participants often gets media attention, it is actually quite narrow when compared with the confidence band around the inflation forecast. The federal funds rate path differs from the other variables in the SEP because policymakers choose the path. But because there's uncertainty around each participant's projections of growth, the unemployment rate, and inflation, there's also uncertainty around the appropriate policy path. Providing a confidence band would help remind people that the median policy path in the SEP is not meant to be a firm commitment on the part of the FOMC. Instead, policy should be expected to respond to changes in economic and financial conditions that materially affect the median run outlook. As you can see in figure four, the range of reasonable outcomes for the policy path is actually quite wide and considerably wider than some of the variation we've seen in the SEP policy path over time, even though those shifts have often drawn considerable media attention. My second recommendation is that the FOMC prevent, present a forecast that could serve as the benchmark for understanding the FOMC's policy actions and post-meeting statements. The median paths in the SEP are a step in that direction, but the variables aren't linked. So for example, there's no guarantee that someone projecting the median inflation path would necessarily be projecting the median output path. Publishing a benchmark forecast with error bands, as do many other central banks, would make it somewhat easier to explain how the economic outlook is dependent on the future path of monetary policy. In 2012, the FOMC experimented with developing a forecast representing the consensus of the committee. It proved difficult to reach a consensus on a consensus forecast, but I think we should continue to pursue this. In the meantime, we should consider publishing the staff's forecast. Policymakers need not agree with the staff's forecast, but they could use it as a benchmark against which to explain how and why their forecast may differ. My third recommendation pertains to our post-meeting FOMC statement. While it continues to serve the committee well, I believe the statement could do more to dissuade people from thinking short term and to illuminate that policy is being formulated based on the median run outlook, the risks around the outlook, and the progress on our policy goals. The statement is an important part of FOMC communications, providing information on the mapping from economic conditions to the outlook and then to policy actions. The current formulation of the statement does highlight factors that are important in that reaction function, namely median run outlook, uh, run outlook for inflation, resource utilization, and inflation expectations. But the first paragraph of the statement tends to concentrate on changes in economic conditions since the last FOMC meeting, which can spur a short run focus. The facts in the paragraph are always true. Investment has been soft, unemployment has little changed, employment growth has been, on, been solid on average, and so on. But we can improve the public's understanding of our monetary policy strategy if we provided more interpretation of those facts, namely our assessment of how recent changes in economic and financial data have or have not changed the median run outlook, the risks around the outlook, and therefore the appropriate policy path. We can also strive for more consistency about the conditions we systematically assess in calibrating the stance of policy so that the public would get a better sense of the committee's reaction function over time. In summary, uncertainty is the norm, not the exception. I believe it would serve both the public and the FOMC well if we more explicitly acknowledge this uncertainty. Doing so will help the public evaluate whether changes in economic conditions or in the outlook are significant or not. It will help them see that the economy often evolves differently than the modal forecast, and that it's better to focus on the median run than on the short run fluctuations in the data. It will give them a better sense of what policymakers mean when they say their policy is data dependent. My suggestions here are simple ones but I believe they're consistent with the evolutionary changes the FOMC has been making on its journey to increased in transparency. Although policy communications will likely always remain somewhat of a challenge, I believe striving for even clearer communications is worth the effort. Thank you for your attention.
Aye. This on? Guy Hazelman, thank you. Um, I have a two-part question. Um, can you refresh my memory as to exactly why 2% inflation is such a good thing? And I ask this because of the Fed's willingness to conduct this enormous experiment to try to micromanage inflation from one and a half to two percent. What it does, or from yeah, what it does is it presupposes that you think the benefits outweigh the costs. The costs being the unintended consequences, such as the damage to pension funds or asset bubbles or this massive amount of indebtedness. So maybe you could talk a little bit about um, how you measure, it seems like the models measure the benefits, how you actually look at those potential uh, consequences and whether they're worth the risk of trying to get inflation up. Okay, so I think a, an explicit numerical goal, and we'll talk a minute about why 2%, is, is very beneficial in that this is the one thing that a central bank can control. Right? We can affect inflation. And being committed to your inflation goal prevents inflation from going higher, much higher, which we know has very high costs on the economy, or deflation, which we've experienced has been very disruptive in, in, in economies. So being explicit about the goal and being committed to making the goal, I think, is very beneficial in the way you do policy. 2% right, balances, in most of the research, you know, has been found to balance the costs and benefits. Um, there's been some talk about maybe 2% in a very low R-star environment. Um, we should rethink that goal. But to my mind, right, the 2% was balancing the costs and benefits. If you, go, if you decide to set a higher goal than 2%, then you're basically imposing cost on the economy over all states of the world, whether we're you know, in a good time or bad time. Lower than 2%, you hit the zero lower bound problems that we talked about this morning. So 2% was intended to balance those. And it's, it's that level, 2%, has been consist very popular across a lot of central banks. But in, in thinking of the future, some of the issues that we talked about this morning, that's certainly something that people are thinking about. My personal view is I would like to hit the 2% goal. But I take your point, right? Then the question is, Given the error bands around our inflation forecast, how close do you have to get before you're convinced that getting back to 2% is a reasonable forecast? And my forecast is that we're going to get back to 2%, which is one of the reasons that I th think that being on this gradual upward path of interest rates is appropriate and continues to be appropriate. Great. Dr. Messer, I, I noted uh, you mentioned uh, mismeasured constructs in your, in your speech. I was wondering if you could opine a little bit on how the Fed kind of measures dislocations in the economy um, as it's looking uh, at its policy framework. And I say that in the context of as the macro strategist on equity floor, and I see a tremendous buildup in what I describe as interest rate factors within global equity portfolios. And I think that's one of the reasons why the traditional negative correlation between bond and equity prices has been diminishing, and in fact over some time period's actually gone positive, and I think that that's describing potential financial instability in the economy that's building at the moment. So we, before the financial crisis, we would look at financial markets, you know, we would monitor for financial stability, but it wasn't in a systematic way. Since the financial crisis, the Fed is doing a much better job of looking at precisely the things that you mentioned. Um, there's a division at the board now dedicated to think, looking at and monitoring financial conditions. Um, there's a nice paper that Nellie Lang and, and her group put out about the framework for looking. It's not just looking at bank markets, not just looking at equity markets. It's trying to look at the whole financial system and looking for the kinds of imbalances that you're referring to. Are we monitoring, every, you know, is everything precisely that we're monitoring? No. I mean, we're, we have a much better insight, I think, into the banking part of the financial system than others because of our regulatory role there. Um, but there is certainly systematic analysis looking at precisely the things you're worried about. And more urgency now, of course, as we've been at zero interest rates, we know that that can spur some of the imbalances that you're talking about. Search for your yield behavior people taking on risks that they're not 
um, fully appreciative of, of what those risks are. Um, earlier on, there was a buildup, and my colleague Eric Rosengren of the Boston Fed has pointed to the commercial real estate market as an area um, where he had some concern um, about that. Those imbalances seem to have been stabilized a little bit, but certainly there's ongoing um, you know, monitoring of, of those conditions. My own view is I don't see urgency that we need to be bringing rates up to combat those kinds of imbalances at this point. But, it's, but it is something that you need to be aware of when you're running policy the way we have. My argument, the reason I dissented in the last meeting right, was really based on what's happening to our, it's basic, it's, you know, really basic monetary policy. What's happening to our um, dual mandate goals, the progress we've made, the progress I expect to continue to make. Um, I think we're basically at full employment from the point of view of what monetary policy can do. The inflation measures have moved up over the past year, just as the FOMC anticipated, as some of the effects of oil prices and the depreciation of the dollar work through. Right? So I think there's a strong, you know, compelling case based upon where we are in the macro side of the traditional view of the world on dual mandate goals that we should be moving up. And our own forecast right, suggests that the median, the, the, a gradual increase in interest rates is the appropriate policy path. So to my mind, it was a compelling case that, you know, we should take the next step. Couple with that, that some of the risks that the FOMC had pointed to earlier in the year, the, the economy was pretty resilient through those. So if you remember, early in the year, we had volatility in financial markets. We had the down, you know, the reassessment of growth in China and the effect that might have on the U.S. economy. We had the Brexit vote in June. Um, you know, we had the past... Um, appreciation of the dollar, and we had the oil price impacts on investment. A lot of those risks, the economy has proven to be pretty resilient through those. Um, and again, I think that was part of the case why, in my mind, it would make sense to take the next step on a gradual path. Mary? Thank you. And thank, I'm Mary O'Grady from The Wall Street Journal. Um, thank you for your remarks. I wanted to ask you something that wasn't specifically in your talk, but it's, I think, on the mind of a lot of people, which is that um, the balance sheet is not normal. <laughs> and um, there has been an expectation that the Fed, when the economy recovered and everything, that the Fed would try to get the balance sheet back to something more normal. And um, the, the Fed seems to have a reluctance to get back to normal. Um, conventional wisdom is that it doesn't want to spook the markets by shrinking the balance sheet, but then people say, well, why doesn't it just let you know, some of that stuff roll off? And one theory that I've heard more recently is that the Fed wants to leave those reserves there because if it raises rates and the economy has trouble, it would, not, it would, it would be um, unfortunate for it to have to say to the public that it is going to do another round of QE. But having those um, reserves there, it could just simply lower what it pays on them and hope that they go out of the Fed. So I'm wondering, is that true? Is that the theory that they're working? I mean, what, what explains this giant balance sheet that they don't want to shrink, even though it has all kinds of potential to cause problems down the road? Thank you. So that's a question about whether the stance of monetary policy is appropriate or not, right? Because there's two parts, right? There's what we're doing with the balance sheet in terms of putting downward pressure on long interest rates, right? And we can debate whether we think it's still effective or not, because that's part of the, the discussion, similar to some of the things we talked about earlier today. And then there's the interest rate. In my view, the same factors that would influence where you'd want to put the interest rate also influence your decisions about the balance sheet, right? I think of them both as tools of accommodation or non-accommodation. What the FOMC has said is that they really want to signal their policy stance with the interest rate. And partly it's because this is the, the policy tool that the public has understanding about. It's the way we've communicated our policy for, for several, many, many years. It's, it's sort of the, the tool that's more known. Right? And so the idea is let's, you know, as we started to normalize, we would be normalizing first using the interest rate, the Fed funds rate. 
And then at a certain point, we would stop reinvesting. In other words, let what's on the balance sheet roll off. It will take, that's a long term, it rolls off very slowly, right? And then let that happen. And then eventually, you know, we would basically have the balance sheet go back to a more normal level. And normal in this environment could be different than what it was pre-crisis. I think that's still a valid strategy. Um, to, and then the question is, well, what would trigger sort of the stopping of the reinvestment? And I, to my mind, it's basically if we get the fund rate up, you know, a couple more notches, then it would make sense. Then we could actually allow that to, to, to run off. I don't think that it's, it's any more conspiratorial about sort of, you know, we don't have the precision that sort of everyone thinks that we can move one level or another. It's basically on the same conditions. When the economy, when we get closer to our goals, right, which I think we're doing, when we're basically um, growing around trend, you know, the unemployment rate is back down to our, the natural rate of unemployment or the long run level, right, inflation is back to our goal. That's all suggested that we need to take off accommodation, and that will happen with the balance sheet as well. Hi. Another balance sheet question, really. Can you separate balance sheet from interest rate policy? Countries uh, with central banks that are leading with interest rate policy, such as Australia and Canada, their balance sheet actually moves in conjunction with that, since you tightened by about net an eighth of a point, really, from where federal funds were to where they are now, reserves have shrunk by $300 billion, I think, something like that. So can you really separate those two, or do you expect a balance sheet to more or less follow what you're trying to do with interest rate policy? Well, I mean, we've only moved the interest rate up. <laughs> You know, one time, so it's kind of hard to like, you know, say that we're, we're we're having the two tools. But I mean, here's a situation where you know, if we take to heart, you know, there's downward pressure on long rates because of other things going on globally, right? It could be that if we raise the short end, right, of our yield curve, that we're not going to see as much action on the on the long end. You could use the balance sheet in that context, right, and have it run off or start shrinking it faster to get the long rate up again. It's all going back to where, what do you think is appropriate for the level of, of accommodation right, in the US economy, right? So you can use them sort of to try to make sure that you know, the, traditionally when you raise the short rate, long rates would go up, right? So our tool would be the short rate, but we'd expect the balance sheet to go up. In this environment, it's possible that that won't happen given what the globalization and, and the monetary policies being run Right, and other co countries are very accommodative, and we we would be taking away some of the accommodation. Policy is going to remain accommodative here. We talked about that this morning too, right? No one's talking about you know, you know, taking away all the accommodation. Even Charlie Calamiris's proposal would still leave accommodation, right? Even though he's having a much sharper increase in interest rates in his proposal. Um, but nonetheless, right? You'd want to then say, okay, are we actually having an impact on the longer end? of the interest rate spectrum, and there you could use your balance sheet to, to do that. So you're right, they're linked. Nisa? Thank you. <clears throat> uh, the various econometric estimates of R star notwithstanding, can you intuitively explain why the current R star is around 0% and the long-term R star is closer to 1% as opposed to 2%? Well, that's some of the things we talked about this morning, right? So low productivity growth, and we can talk about why that's as low as it is, right? Some theories are there are no new ideas, which I don't ascribe to. Um, I'm on the board of the Cleveland Clinic, and I'll tell you, there's a lot of new ideas out there that I think will end up being productive ideas. Um, low investment, which is partly from the oil prices, right, has kept investment down and productivity down. Um, we talked this morning about some of the regulatory changes that perhaps were the right regulatory changes in the financial system given the risks that was in the system, but nonetheless it is something that firms have to deal with. So there's a number of reasons why you'd think that our you know, real rates around the, the uh, you know, global savings glut that people talk about is putting downward pressure on our star. Um, so those are the kinds of things, right? We're in an environment where um, you know, if we don't get the productivity growth up, and I agree with 
the people who have said that that's really not something that monetary policy can do. We have to take that into account when we set policy, but we're not going to affect those, those underlying structural aspects of the economy. Other policies, I think, can do that, but not monetary policy. Marvin? Yeah, um, I have a question that follows some of the discussion we've just had. On the one hand, you have balance sheet policy. You would think, part one of my question is, balance sheet policy must have some, you must have some sense of how much interest rate effect the balance sheet policy has at the moment. Mm -hmm. Presumably, if it was working at all, uh, you know, it, it, you would have to raise the federal funds rate higher than otherwise if you have a big balance sheet policy, which would have been stimulative. Mm -hmm. So I'm confused about this. The natural rate forecasts that, that have been made by Lubbock and Williams go back 20 years. Mm -hmm. But we had this balance sheet policy for the last few years. Mm -hmm. So you see where I'm going. One question, there's a bunch of questions that come up in my mind. One is, when you're, when you're asked to forecast at the FOMC the future real short rate or short rate, does that involve some assumption about how big the balance sheet's going to be? Because if you don't make an assumption, I don't know how to interpret what you're talking right. about. Yep. And neither does the rest of the world. Okay. So this is not an idle issue. Right. So. As you know, everybody puts in their forecast, right? So when they do this summary of economic projections, you put in a forecast for what you think all those variables that we collect are. Everyone's making some assumption, presumably not only about the size of the balance sheet, but the effect on the long end of, of, the, of the yield curve, right? So we don't report that because we're not asked to report that, but that would be part of the narrative of when you're thinking about what you think the appropriate policy path will be. Now, we can talk about whether you think that we should be forecasting that as well and including that um, in, the, in the thing. But it's endogenous, right? It's sort of like we, you know, it's, it's the same thing as everyone sort of has a, a, a view of what they're going to assume about what's going to happen to the exchange rate or other kinds of variables. We're not publishing them, but that's going to feed into what, when you come up for your forecast. It's the same thing on the short rate. The public might want to know two separate issues. You know, what, what do you think the real natural rate would be absent the balance sheet, net of the balance sheet policy, and then how much do you think the balance sheet policy accounts for? That would enable us to really get a much better idea of what the Federal Reserve's thinking is and how we might regard future policies that might let the balance sheet run off or not. And, and the, by conflating the two, it seems to make it unnecessarily hard to figure out what's going on. Why don't you separate the two? Why don't I'm, I'm not. Okay, you're, you think that would illuminate things? I'm not convinced that would illuminate things, actually. David. Uh, uh, David Malpass, on the same, uh, same question. Um, so the Japanese have decided that steepening the yield curve will be more accommodative because it will help the insurance companies, it helps uh, savers. And so I, will you review for us once again why the flattening of the yield curve here uh, is accommodative. How is it accommodative? How confident of that are you? And you moments ago said you thought the Fed might con continue to keep a balance sheet bigger than pre-crisis. Mm -hmm. What did you mean by that? OK, so one of the issues that you have to think about when you have interest rates as low as we've had them for as long is the effect on the banking system, for example, in Japan is a good case, right? So if you keep interest rates low and you disrupt the financial system, i.e. net interest margins for banks, and they run into trouble, then you're going to have another problem in your, in your economy, right? So in the U.S., we have a, we're much better off in terms of the capitalization or our banking system. So that hasn't been a focus, right, of monetary policy. But in Japan, the situation is different. And so I think what they're trying to do with their policy is to sort of take into account the impact on the banks in Japan from a low interest rate policy on the short end and to sort of make sure that they're running this fine line where the banks maintain healthy right, as they're putting more accommodation into the system. U.S., we haven't had to face that because we've recapitalized our banks and they're sh much stronger than they were prior to the crisis. In terms of the so what's the right size of the balance sheet, remember, we have a new tool for doing monetary policy that we didn't have pre-crisis, which is, is this interest rate on excess reserves. 
You know, in fact, when with a very large balance sheet, that's the mechanism for raising rates. So there's a, a project going on in the Federal Reserve System that we've we've talked about publicly, which is thinking about what's the longer run framework, right, for running monetary policy, right, down the road. Like, what will normal look like in terms of the way we do policy? And so one of the aspects of that is, would you want to return to a very scarce um, reserve system, you know, essentially a corridor system, or would you allow want the balance sheet to be larger than it has been because we have this interest rate on excess reserves, which means we can raise interest rates even with a large balance sheet. And so that's one of the things that has to be discussed. Different countries do it differently, um, and that would be on the table. So it could be that we end up with a balance sheet that goes back, we're still having scarcity of reserves. It'll be larger just because you know we have currency growing, and so we're going to have a larger balance sheet. Or do you want to have a balance sheet that is larger um, and reserves aren't scarce and run policy that way. And that's part of the dis ongoing discussion about where, where we will go. But none of that is kind of right now because our balance sheet is large. It's going to stay large for a long, you know, long time, even if we let things run off. Charlie? Thanks for a great speech, Loretta. <clears throat> and uh, I also want to congratulate you on your three recommendations for policy, which I thought were really specific and clear. And this emphasis on medium-term thinking, which, uh, you know, Alan Meltzer in his discussion of the history of the Fed says, this is maybe the greatest deficiency of policy is its lack of that focus. And I really loved your graphs, um, which you prepared for us, which I think is the, the best um, handout we've ever had from a, from a speaker. <laughs> And but so I'd like to ask you a little bit about um, if I, I wasn't sure whether the information used to prepare this is public. I thought it might be, and and if it is public, then this is something that anyone could do. Uh, for example, the Cleveland Fed could do it as part of its uh, data release. Yep. And if it's not public, which part of it isn't public? Okay. And and okay, the information. So being all used. the information in there is public. So rest assured. And I'm not releasing any any now. But one thing you'll notice in there is that the median path in there is from the latest SEP, which is the, the uh, September Summary of Economic Projections. That gets released at the time of the release of the statement. The table of errors, forecast errors, which I mentioned in, in the talk, Right, that will get released with the minutes, so three weeks later. So this, right now, I'm using the June table for the errors and the September median path. Believe me, it's, it, that's an immaterial thing, but that's why it's all public at the moment is because I'm doing that. But you're right, anybody can do this. Um, I, I've been told we don't have time for more questions, but I'm gonna ask you uh, two. You're gonna ask me one anyway. <laughs> I'm going to ask you two unrelated questions, and you can go through them quickly. The okay. first is, um, just how will or how will the dynamics of the FOMC meetings, like the next meeting, how will they change now that there are three official dissents? And the second question is, uh, you are on the Fed subcommittee on communications. So what is the probability that your three recommendations, <laughs> particularly changing the policy statement after each meeting, th that, that the Fed will actually implement it? Okay, so remember when, I think when you introduced me, you said something about I was sitting, when I was a research director, I was sitting in the room and occasionally getting frustrated, and then somehow now I'm a voter? You know that frustration part? Still, is the same thing, but anyway. Um, and nothing's changed there. Um, okay, so, no, but in terms of the dynamics of the meeting, look, the FLMC meetings are very good discussion meetings. And I know people have an impression of, like, what, what it's like, but we really all come in based, and that's what's great about the structure that we were talking at the table today about the regional structure of the Federal Reserve System, why it's so important. I'm a regional bank president. There are 12 of them. We come in with our own independent view of the economy, we bring in the district information, what we've seen in our own districts, because that really helps me think about policy. 
right, and where we want to be, and that kind of information augments the data that I was talking about in terms of the uncertainty of the data. And we sit around the table and we talk about our own views of, of the economy. Whether there's were dissents, three dissents at the last meeting or not, we're all doing that. And voters or non-voters, we all bring our view in. So the meeting, I don't imagine there will be anything different about the meeting just because there were three dissents at the last meeting. I think it's a good illustration of the fact that we're in a, in a situation where, right, even in the statement it says the, the case for taking the next step on the gradual path is strengthened. I think that's reflected in the vote. Um, and then, you know, I'm not going to predict what the committee, subcommittee on communication is, is going to be doing. But as I mentioned, you know, this is thinking about whether we want to do fan charts or not has been a topic of discussion. Okay. I want to thank you very, very much for your outstanding speech thank and you. responses. Thank you very much. Thank you.